I want you to imagine uh, waking up this morning, not in your lovely dwellings, uh, not in your cozy warm bed, but I want you to imagine waking up on a dirt floor, uncomfortable, uh, pretty confident that you're not going to have a meal today. And add on top of that, you're in hiding uh, because the guy that you've been following uh, for a couple of years uh, was just killed a couple of days ago. And you are humiliated. You are in fear of your life and you have reason to be because the leader that you were following uh, claimed to be the Messiah, got himself killed in part because of that, and now they're looking for the followers uh, to kill them as well. So you are in terror, and you wake up and you feel hopeless. You're hungry, you're humiliated, and once again, all the voices that you've heard ever since you started being able to listen and understand voices in any way uh, have come true. You are worthless. You should not feel good about yourself. God does not care about you. The people that God cares about are the people who have money and the people who have power. That's what you've experienced your whole life. If you lived in the first century and you were a Jesus follower on this day, that's how you would feel. Your poverty would tell you you are worthless even in the eyes of God. You've followed the wrong leader. Now the Roman government, who claims to be God incarnate as an empire, is after you too. This is your experience Easter morning. Now let's find out what happened according to the scripture. So Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Now, so just to kind of back up the truck a little bit, if you've never seen the movie or anything, um, the way it would work is uh, if you were wealthy, uh, you could have a sort of a cave uh, dug into a hillside or into the rock, uh, just big enough for, um, for a tomb. And you'd have to have a lot of money to do that. And then to seal the thing, uh, they would craft out a very large, um, almost like a wheel, kind of like you see in the edge of the picture there, about four feet high or so. And they would prop it up so that if you took off, off a little stop, almost like a door stopper, uh, it would roll more easily into place. But this thing is several hundred pounds. So you have two women who are going to the tomb to take care of Jesus' body. And there's no way they're going to deal with that stone. So just to give you a picture of what that looks like in the scale. All right, let's go on to the next slide. But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. The women fled from the tomb, trembling and bewildered, and they said nothing to anyone because they were too frightened. So this is day one. They don't know what to think. They've had this experience of God you know, at the tomb, but it's all nonsense at this point. So now I want to fast forward uh, several years, and I want to hear from the Apostle Paul, uh, who's going to recount what happened after the first Easter Sunday. So let's jump in and see what he has to say. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. It's interesting what he says there. It is this good news that saves you. That word saves is not just save your soul, but is to restore you, to heal you. That's the root word that we're looking at there. If you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place, I passed on to you what was most important and what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the Scriptures said. 
He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. So if you're in the first century, you woke up hungry, extremely poor, every voice around you is saying you don't count and God is not on your side, Easter changed everything. That's why Easter is everything. Because now you have this one who is experienced in a myriad forms. It's kind of weird and mysterious, all the different ways that Jesus or Christ was experienced after uh, he was raised from the dead. Uh, but now this one that you've been following is totally legitimate, has come, shown himself to you, and he's saying to you, have real hope. Whatever you've heard about the Roman Empire being God and Lord and Domitian and all that stuff, that is not true. You have a person here that you've been following, and he's saying to you, you who've been told all your life that you're worthless, that's not the case. Now, some of you can really relate to this story uh, because some of you have had life experiences that while the extreme poverty part may not be there, you've been told things your whole life that have meant to demoralize you, to bring you down, to make you feel bad about yourself. Some of you have even been told that God does not love you or does not care for you because of whatever you've been into. Like God has turned God's back on you. And the message of Easter is it's just not true. Some of you have, uh, have a very bad prognosis for your health. And you know that um, this story hits home a little closer or somebody you love very much or maybe for you, it's just the recognition that we never know what's going to happen. My heart sank this week uh, when I saw the headlines uh, from Kenya uh, that a gunman went and mowed down 160-some uh, uh, Christian college students. That's terrible anywhere, and it's awful anywhere. But knowing what that meant for those families, that those students were the hope of an entire family, it's just horrible. And the truth is, we don't know uh, how many days we have. That was last week's sermon. <laughs> Take advantage of the days that you have and do what you need to do. But there is great hope in knowing that when this life is done, it's not all done. There is hope beyond. And some of you just need to own that and celebrate it and hold on to it because it's real and true. It was real and true in the first century it's been real and true all the centuries since. Christ is risen from the dead, and it reminds us that there is more to be had. And frankly, uh, for many of us in our culture, Easter is everything because Easter is kind of the only thing. What I mean by that is this. You and I, uh, we live in a part of the world and a time in history uh, when we can do just about anything and everything for ourselves. Uh, we're not really praying to God to deliver, well, we're kind of praying to God to deliver rain in its season, <laughs> or even out of its season in California, because we want, we want the rain, but we don't think that way like ancients did. Uh, you're not wondering if God is going to, you know, provide you a child so that you can count on them to take care of you in your old age. It's not how we think. You go to the grocery store and you buy food. You're not going to go hungry today. If, even if you're homeless in Napa, there's food available all the time. It's not the world we live in. We live in a safe country uh, where we generally don't have to worry about the tyranny of the government coming in and wiping us out. It's not how we think. And so because we've almost replaced God in so many ways in our lives, for some of us, it's kind of like Easter's the only thing we're really caring about because we know we can't buy our way into God. We know we can't do anything about what happens after we die, so we hold on to this hope of Easter because it's the only thing that we can't control. It's the only way we can't be God. And so if that's where you're at today, that's cool because we understand the teaching of Jesus and to follow Jesus and understand what he's saying to us is that we have hope. 
And I hope that you'll at least start there. But I have more for you today because I think the gospel has more for us than just waiting until we die. In fact, I think if we listen to the whole message that Jesus is talking about, what Easter is really about, that you can start to experience the power of Easter today and carry on to the next year. So on the next slide, I have a couple questions for you. Then we're going to march through my little display. I want to ask you the question, what if life could be exceptionally better? We have it pretty good. We have it pretty good where we live. Uh, we're rare, and, and the billions of people in the world, we're close to the top in terms of great experiences of life just by where we live. What if it could be exceptionally better? What if you could contrast your life now as it's going, the way that our culture uh, instructs us to live, and contrast that to the way of following Jesus, which is different than the way the culture instructs us to live? What if the one with Jesus leads to a life that is far deeper, more robust, has a greater impact on life, is more hopeful, has healthier relationships, healthier everything? Would that be worth taking consideration to? And then the, the second question is, how resurrected will you be in Easter 2016? Because I believe resurrection is a now thing as much as it is a future thing. How resurrected will you be a year from now? How different are you right now from a year ago? Is your relationship with God any different than it was a year ago? Are you in a deeper place? Some of you are shaking your head yes, and I know your story. So I'm preaching to the choir with you. But if this is all news to you, I hope that my little display might encourage you that we would all come back next year uh, with a whole different set of stories to talk about, about how God helped resurrect our story even today. And it starts off, naturally, with a playground ball. This is a brand new playground ball. Mmm, that smells so good. Smell that for me, Zane. Does it smell? Is it brand new? All right, he's verifying this is brand new. Andy, make sure that's a brand new ball. Did you smell it? you got to smell it, man. Isn't that nice? Ben, smell pretty good. Trudy, just want to verify this, the good scent. Now, you want to smell it? All right, absolutely. It smells pretty good, right? What's it smell like? It's, it smells like rubber, right? Because it's a rubber ball. And why did they make a play ball, playground ball out of rubber? Why didn't they make it like out of bowling ball material? because it won't bounce, right? The reason they made it out of rubber is because they needed it to be able to stretch, to get a little bigger at times, to deflate at other times. And the Christian faith is like that. To realize Easter, to experience resurrection in our life is to invite God more and more into our lives now. And it is an openness to being stretched by God, much like a rubber playground ball. Nicodemus was a Ph.D. of his time. He knew theology inwards and outwards. He went to meet Jesus undercover a night, and while he was with him, found out he didn't know as much as he thought he did. Jesus stretched his thinking. Later on, Jesus is with a woman at a well in a country called Samaria. And while he's with her, who he shouldn't have been talking to in the first place, she found out he was different than she'd ever believed a Jewish man could be. And all of her preconceived notions had to be wiped away. She got stretched like a rubber ball gets stretched. Stretchiness is a key to experiencing resurrection. You know, a weird thing, if you read the, uh, the accounts of Easter, which I gave you in your bulletin guts, um, if you kind of follow my model there, every day you got a little different something to read, and I give you all the gospel accounts of the resurrection, of what today did. What you're going to notice is that they're very different from each other. Uh, and that's okay. That actually uh, helps validate the fact that it's historical, that they're not all in cahoots together, but they say things that are moderately different. But one thing that's crazy to me is that these different people that had this experience of the resurrected Christ, they didn't know who it was until later. And so even the, even the day of Easter, uh, the resurrected Christ is walking along the road with a couple of his followers on the way to this little village called Emmaus. 
and they have no idea <laughs> that it's him. And they only figure it out at the very end of their journey when they finally get there. And he has communion with them, and all of a sudden their eyes are opened. Other people had the same kind of thing, not knowing who it was. Even later on, uh, some of the fishermen disciples were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and they came to shore where Christ was waiting for them, even had breakfast prepared for them. And there's this one little line that we go over really quickly in the Bible. It says, no one dared ask him if he was the Lord because they knew it. What? There's a mystery here. There's a stretchiness that's required. If God really is God, if God is really that big, then it means we've got to be open to having our minds blown. And so if you want to experience Easter, not just when you die, which is great, but if you want to start to experience a new life, a resurrected life now, it's incumbent on you to stretch. It's a part of the deal. It's not the only thing. These are all markers of the way, by the way. And if you haven't stretched much in your faith, that's a problem. And it probably says something that needs, needs to be fixed. The next thing uh, that I really like, oh, and by the way, I just got to do a couple of shout-outs uh, here this morning. Uh, one person that represents this really well that I've applauded to her face is Dot Hoover, who's sitting right over there. Uh, Dot Hoover is one of our saints here in this church. She's been here for about 20 years or so, got here just before I did. You know what I love about Dot? Dot grew up a preacher's kid, which means she was in church every week and got the Bible pounded into her from uh, as soon as she knew uh, how to read and, and before, just like I did. And she was in church the whole, all of her life, uh, taught all kinds of things, and yet what I love about Dot is she's still learning. She still shows up to my Bible study, still giving insight, still asking questions. Why? Because she's stretching, and she knows that is a mark of a disciple. So way to go, Dot. You make me proud. I want to be you when I grow up. Nice going. <clears throat> the next thing, of course, uh, has to do with this shoe brush. Now this one, I don't know what I got on there. It looks like saddle soap or something like that. You know I use these, right? This is kind of an old school thing. You use this to polish your shoes, right? Uh, the thing about shoe brushes is if you're going to do somebody else's shoes, Andy, your shoes aren't going to work. There's some shoes I can polish right there. If you're going to polish somebody else's shoes, let me help you out there, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, let me know if I get this right. Thank you. I get $10, please. Um, <laughs> In order to do what I just did, you have to get on your knees. You have to kneel. If you're going to serve somebody in a way where you're cleaning them up, helping them out, it requires you to get down on your knees. Part of being a Jesus follower, part of developing this relationship, part of allowing an inroad for resurrection to happen is to follow Jesus in the acts of service that he did. He was famous for this, doing all kinds of stuff for people just as an act of service. He's healing people, he's feeding people, he's teaching people, all these things. He's kneeling in service. There are some people around here uh, that really know what this is about and are integrating them. Actually, there's too many to name, but I want to lift up a couple different groups. One is uh, Darlene Tremune in the food pantry. Every Monday and Wednesday, uh, they get fresh produce delivered here that they then turn around and give it away for free for anybody who needs it. It's remarkable. And once a month, uh, we give as many as 50 to 70 families enough food to last for a week because they have more month than money. You know what I mean? Uh, it's remarkable how many hours behind the scenes the food pantry folks give. So if you are a part of the food pantry ministry, just wave your hand. There's a bunch of you. And give them applause. And if you talk to them uh, after food distribution day, which is usually exhausting uh, for them, they will mostly have very good things to say and their hearts will be a little bit bigger because they got to serve. When we serve, when we kneel in service, it gives God an opportunity to break into our lives. Resurrection happens. The worship team that you have up here, uh, it takes a lot of work uh, to get up here, to learn songs, to get them down. Hours and hours of work. So when you applaud for them, you're doing the right thing because it takes an extraordinary amount of time. The coffee that you're enjoying today, somebody kneeled in service to make sure that you had that. Lots of stuff. My question for you is how's your kneeling going? Are you serving in any capacity? Because if you're not, 
Uh, that means you're a little bit out of step with Jesus. And if you're a little bit out of step with Jesus, it means that it's going to be a little bit harder for this resurrection reality to happen. These are ways of Christ. The next thing, the magic eraser. Anybody use these things? They really are magic. I don't know how they work. They're incredible. They'll take about anything off. Magic erasers, for me, this represents grace. There were a couple key stories in the Gospel of John uh, where Jesus uh, used this very well. One is probably his most famous uh, act of grace that he ever did. He's teaching, and right as he's in the middle of his sermon, uh, some religious leaders uh, threw a woman in front of him, uh, basically naked, just caught in the act of adultery. And they asked him, uh, what should we do with her? The law says we should stone such women. Do you think we should? And they thought they had him in checkmate. Uh, because if he said, yeah, I think we should stone her, uh, then he'd make the Jewish fundamentalists really happy for following the Bible really well. But Rome took that right away, so he'd be arrested and killed by Rome. And if he said, no, we shouldn't because we'd be breaking the law, then the fundamental uh, Jewish scholars would say, oh, he's not even Jewish. He's not strong enough to even do what the Bible tells him to do. And he'd lose his credibility that way. So they thought they had him cornered. Instead, he scribbles in the sand. You've probably heard the story. And then he looks up and he says, you who are sinless among you, you cast the first stone. Just levels the whole field. Nobody has the right to judge another. And so everybody walks away. And Jesus sees the woman and just simply says, woman, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And she says back to him, neither do I. Before she even asks for forgiveness, he says, neither do I. That's how expansive the grace of God is. And some of us feel like that woman, feel like there are things that we've been a part of in our life, things that we never thought we'd get into, and yet there we are, things that if we could go back and redo everything, we probably would, things that have kept us from really living. We feel constrained by our past decisions. But Jesus comes along with a magic eraser and says, I'm speaking from the heart of God. God's love is bigger. It is an unstoppable love that loves you. And you're free. In another way, Jesus did the same thing with a guy that was born blind. Back in that day, if you were born with that kind of infirmity, everybody assumed that it was because God was judging you in some way or judging your parents or your grandparents. So this poor guy, from the moment he was born, was condemned by his whole community saying, God really doesn't like you because you're blind. And so all he could do was beg. Jesus follows up with him. He's now an adult. He's begging on the street. And Jesus says, what can I do for you? He says, I would love to see. So Jesus does this kind of ancient method of making this mud paste with his spit. I won't get into that. There's, it's very interesting. But he puts it on his eyes and says, well, go wash this off. And so he goes and washes in the water, and he can see immediately. This sent a message to him, to everybody, God's love, God's grace is bigger than. Maybe that's all you need to hear today. Maybe you need to just take a deep breath and realize that you came to church today and the roof did not cave in. <laughs> the lightning has not yet struck. And it's because God loves you. I don't care what you've been up to. I don't care what anybody else has done to you. I don't care what people have said to you that might limit the grace of God. God's love is bigger than always. And somebody that uh, I want to shout out on this one, because not only is this a taking thing from God, of letting God clean us up, it's also something we then extend to other people. Brian Worrell, uh, who I love, uh, been a crosswalker for many years now, told me a story just a couple weeks ago about a kid that uh, he ran into and was talking with, and he said, Pastor Pete, i got to tell you this story. So I, I know Brian's story, and I've walked with him, and uh, it's, it's an amazing testimony that he has. And he said, you know, I was talking to this kid, and he was, he was struggling with some of the things that I've struggled with. And I just sat him down, and I told him, I said, look, man, it's going to be all right. And I told him my story, and I said, God is with you, and you just got to trust that and keep going forward. And he said, you wouldn't believe the encouragement that showed up in this kid's eyes and in his face. And I was like, Brian, that's, you got it. Way to go. Because it's not just about you sucking all the grace up for yourself, but when you extend it to somebody else and you lift somebody else up, it's like God enters into you and them all at the same time. Resurrection begins to happen. So way to go, Brian Worrell, on uh, being an agent of God. Nice going. Next one's a little tougher for us. 
Remember, see what this is? It's a box of Earl Grey tea. I got to be in the mood for Earl Grey tea, to be honest with you. I'm more of a coffee guy. I don't know if I have time for tea. That's usually my, uh, my problem. You know, if you do tea with somebody, it's not a rushed affair, is it? You go over to their house, and it's not ready. They have to put the kettle on. You have to wait all that time uh, for the tea to get hot or for the water to get hot. And then they get their tea bags out, or if they got the real fancy stuff, the loose leaf, they got to get that all prepared and that cool little ball thing that goes in your cup. And, and then uh, you got to put the water over that, but then you can't even start drinking it. You got to wait, you know, forever, you know, for this tea to finally get ready. And then it's too hot to drink super fast, so you're stuck with this person for who knows how long while you're having tea. And that's my point. That's my point. We live in a very rushed culture where we kid ourselves thinking Facebook friendships are real friendships. I like Facebook. I post stuff pretty often. And I like my friends on Facebook, and it's a cool tool, but it's hardly deep, abiding relationships. And the way of Jesus is. The way of Jesus is incarnate. It is coming alongside as the presence of God through people's highs and their lows. It's an art that we've lost in our culture and it's a key ingredient to resurrection. It's a key ingredient to following in the footsteps of Jesus. So my question for you is, who have you walked slowly with lately? Who have you really steeped the tea with lately? Is there a person that you know is in your, your world that you've just been too busy to spend real time with, to actually listen now, I know there's real good TV on and Giants are about to start, so there's going to be really, really good TV on real soon. But when is enough enough? And when do we have time to just be with each other? Because that's a very Jesus thing to do. And so my encouragement to you is to pull out some tea, maybe even literally, and be patient and walk slowly with somebody and really listen. Because I think God shows up in those moments. Those become holy in and of themselves. You know who this made me think of is Lauren and Lisa Haas. Uh, Lauren and Lisa Haas, uh, Lauren doesn't agree with it. Well, my, at least Lisa Haas, so we can talk about her. <laughs> Lauren and Lisa Haas have been leading a divorce care ministry here for years. They do a marvelous job. They're awesome at it. It requires tea time. It requires them to slow down and be with people in their pain walk with them through their journey, heal them up, and be with them in their joy as they start to see light at the end of the tunnel. These two are awesome when it comes to tea time with people. So well done, guys. You've modeled that well. The next thing I have, these are headphones, obviously, if uh, you can't see. But I invested in these several years ago uh, when I knew I was going to be uh, on a very long flight. These are noise-canceling headphones. Anybody have any of these or ever experienced these things? These are pretty cool. So what I want you to do is I want you to make a sound uh, like this. Okay, do that. Keep doing it. I can't hear it now. <laughs> you can stop. <laughs> noise-canceling headphones are awesome when you're on a long flight or if you have... In uh, my dad's case, a, you know, a terrible snoring issue, and it kind of no takes care of them as well. Uh, the reason I have these together, Jesus had a pair of noise-canceling headphones. You may not have realized that. Well, maybe not really. But he made sure he got out of the noise of his life. He made sure that he took time, and this is the guy who is more connected to God than I think anybody we've ever seen in history. And yet, he needed to break away from the noise of life on occasion and listen and be still. And I wonder how well we're doing that. Maybe you need to invest literally in a pair of noise-canceling headphones, or maybe you need to get yourself out of the noise. Maybe for you, it's your drive time. Maybe you've got a commute ahead of you, and you're so used to popping through the different talk radio shows or whatever you're listening to that there is no room of silence in your life. You can't even hear yourself think, let alone the whisper of God. Maybe it's time if you want to see God break in, if you want to experience Easter more than just a day a year, but every day of the year, maybe it's going to require following Jesus in that way, which is setting aside time to be still. The final thing I have for you, 
Oh, by the way, my shout out on this one, I don't think she's, I think she's out of town today, is Patty Quinlisk. I don't think she's here. Uh, but Patty uh, is one that uh, I know she does this. And the reason I know that she does this is because she forwards me these devotionals uh, that she comes across and says, oh, this was just awesome, and you've got to read this one. And I do, and I love it. I love it because the stuff she sends me is really good, and I love it because it tells me Patty's taken time to be still, to be quiet, to listen for God. And so one clap on the count of three for Patty Quinlis. One, two, three. Nice. Well done. The final one we have here has to do, of course, with WD-40. Uh, if guys love duct tape, they love WD-40 almost as much as they love duct tape. It will fix just about anything. Anybody ever use this stuff? <laughs> a lot of fans of WD-40. So what happens? Uh, you have a lawnmower that's got a bolt that's stuck. It's all rusted or a fence bolt or whatever. You put a little of this magic on there, and you let it sit for a while, and what happens? You go back to it, and all of a sudden you're able to crank this thing free. Resurrection is like that. A lot of times we think about resurrection as just being an after-death thing, but Peter, the apostle Peter, the one who denied even knowing Jesus three times, he actually experienced a resurrection of sorts while he was still alive, and this is what happened. So he knew that he denied Christ three times. He still wants to follow him, but there's this unfinished business. And remember I was telling you that uh, the guys were fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and, and Jesus, uh, the resurrected Christ, was there on the beach preparing breakfast? Well, it, it was in that scene, and they, they come on shore. They're figuring out that this is Christ uh, over time, and at the end of breakfast, they're sitting around the campfire, and it's a, literally a come-to-Jesus moment. And Christ is looking at Peter and says, Hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, You bet I do. And Jesus said, uh, Well, then feed my sheep. And Jesus asked a second time, Peter, do you love me more than these? And maybe he's referring to his stuff, his fishing gear, his friends. And Peter just kind of just easily says, Of course, I just said I loved you. I love you. I love you, Jesus. And, and Jesus says, Well, then feed my lambs. And he asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter at that moment uh, recognized he was being called to account. Just as he denied even knowing Jesus three times, now Jesus himself is saying, what's going on, Peter? Do you really love me? And the tone changes. You can just hear Peter's voice lower. You can see humility kind of enter in, and now he's saying, okay, I get it. Yes, Lord, I love you. What happened in this little exchange? Uh, Jesus reinstates Peter into his full ministry. It was a resurrection. Peter was stuck. He was dead in his stuckness because he hadn't worked it out yet with God. But when Jesus came along and asked these things, it's like Jesus pulled out some WD-40 and said, I'm not, a, I'm not a God. I'm not a guy who's interested in letting people be stuck. So I'm going to I'm going to give you a squirt of WD-40, <laughs> and we're going to unstick you. And Peter got unstuck. This can be all of our lives. You might be stuck right now and thinking that you're on rails and this thing's just going in one direction, you can't get off, and I'm telling you it's not true. This resurrection experience is new and different it is possible for you to experience a life so profoundly different that you would even look back on it, and this is an old term, but you would say, I've actually been born again because this new thing is so different. It's a life worth living. It's a life that is deep, hopeful, abiding, one that is marked by stretchiness, one that is marked by acts of service that you can't help, one that is embedded in grace and motivated by grace, one that takes time with people and has relationships of great value, one that knows it needs to separate itself so that it can be more and more connected with God, one that is continually getting resurrected every day. Easter is everything because it is Christianity. It is what following Christ is about. Not waiting, but right now. Let the new life begin. It is here for you for the taking. If you've never said, I want to follow in this way, if you've never want to be like those who are there, if, you're, if you've ever wondered, what is it like to be there and say, I'm on the way, start today. Decide today. 
What do you have to lose? These are markers of the path. These get you going in the way. These become natural as you follow Christ, and they lead to life now, and they lead to life forever. May you get on it. May you find it. And a year from now, may we come together with louder songs to sing because Easter has been alive every day. Let's pray together. So God, as we are here in this space of worship, on this day, this day of resurrection, may we recognize its power and its strength. For those of us uh, who have loved ones uh, who are near death or know that it's around the corner, I pray that you especially come alongside them and just whisper in their ear, it's true, it's true, it's true. There is more to this life than flesh and blood and a beating heart. May your spirit warm us today that we would know that there is more, that hope is real. And for those of us who don't have that on our radar, for those of us who are just trying to live through our lives as best we can, I pray that you will break through and that you'll remind us that Easter is not a once-a-year thing, it's an everyday thing that we can experience you coming into our lives, renewing us every day. So may we be reflections of your Easter power. May the people around us recognize something new is happening in that person, and may it be because we have a story to tell about the ways we've chosen to follow Jesus that have allowed you to bring us new life. May we be a resurrected and resurrection people because we've chosen to follow you. We ask this in the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen.